we take modern heating for granted. Heat pumps, solar panels, and hybrid systems keep our homes warm with the push of a button. But what if I told you the ancient Romans mastered the art of heat in ways that might just blow your mind? Their methods weren't just ahead of their time, they were downright ingenious. So, what clever heating methods did they use? Winters in ancient Rome could be surprisingly harsh, with chilly days making indoor comfort a challenge. But Roman engineers in the first century AD weren't about to let the cold win. Determined to keep homes warm, they revolutionized heating with an early form of central heating. Their ingenious design involved embedding terracotta tubes inside walls, allowing heat to spread evenly throughout a house. But how did it work? The secret lay in hidden furnaces, burning coal or wood in the basement. As the fires roared, the warm air traveled through the tubes, circulating heat and creating a steady, comfortable warmth. Fast forward to the Dark Ages, and sadly, this brilliant practice fell by the wayside in Europe. But the Romans still had other heating methods up their sleeves. On mildly chilly days, they relied on the sun, moving into sunlit rooms or layering up with warm clothing. Many even designed their homes to face the sun, letting natural light pour through the windows and heat their living spaces. And when night fell, they wrapped themselves in woolen cloaks and hats, trapping warmth the old-fashioned way. But when winter's chill truly set in, they turned to stronger solutions, breaking out their ancient space heaters, focali, charcoal stoves, and braziers. These portable metal fireboxes held glowing hot coals, warming rooms while keeping floors safe with sturdy legs and heat-resistant bases. With convenient handles, they could be carried from room to room, placed near beds, or tucked into cozy corners to radiate warmth throughout the night. Here's a mind-blowing fact. When the Romans relied on continuous furnace burning to heat their homes, they consumed a staggering 114 tons of wood per year. Imagine the sheer effort it took to gather that much fuel, especially during harsh winters when resources were scarce. It was a relentless task that demanded constant labor. And the environmental toll, it was just as severe. The wealthy, of course, took warmth to an entirely new level with underground furnaces that circulated heated air beneath their homes. Using a system called hippocausts, they built hidden fire chambers beneath villas, where hot air from burning wood or coal would travel through hollow floors and walls via tile pipes, radiating heat throughout the space. This ingenious setup functioned much like modern radiant floor heating, creating a steady, comfortable warmth without the need for open flames indoors. For the elite of ancient Italy, it was the height of luxury. How exactly did it work? During construction, rooms were built with a gap between the floor and the foundation. This clever gap allowed hot air generated by burning fires to efficiently circulate, warming the space. A furnace was built under one corner of the room and stoking it produced the hot air needed to heat the room. As the air flowed through the gaps in the floor, the room would warm up nicely. But that's not all. Hippocorps were also used in wall construction, so heat came from both the floors and walls. This luxurious heating system was a status symbol, as it required a team of servants to keep the fires burning. Installing a hypocaust system could even increase the value of the building. Fast forward to the decline of the Roman civilization in Britain, and surprisingly, many of their innovative technologies, including underfloor heating, were abandoned. It took hundreds of years for homeowners to rediscover the joys of warm floors and cozy homes. Though the Romans perfected the hypercost, similar heating systems existed in China, Korea, and Afghanistan centuries earlier. They likely drew inspiration from Greek designs, but refined them into an engineering masterpiece that defined Roman bath houses and villas across Europe. These ancient Romans were genius innovators but even their brilliant Hippocost system had its drawbacks. It was a ticking time bomb, literally. Well, how? Carbon monoxide poisoning from burning fuels was a real threat, and gas leaks from the Pylae supports could be deadly, not to mention the risk of fires getting out of control. But, despite these dangers, the Hippocost system had some fantastic advantages that made it a game changer. And the best part, its legacy lives on in modern underfloor heating systems. So, 
What's so amazing about underfloor heating? For starters, it's incredibly energy efficient, using less fuel while delivering steady, even warmth, unlike traditional heating, which pushes hot air around unevenly. Heat rises naturally from the floor, eliminating annoying cold spots and pesky floor drafts. Another key advantage, radiant energy. Instead of just heating the air, underfloor systems warm up surfaces in the room, turning floors, walls, and furniture into secondary heat sources. This means cozier spaces and fewer temperature fluctuations. And let's not forget the benefits over traditional radiators. Those old school heaters need to be scorching hot to warm up a room, and even then, the hottest air rises to the ceiling, leaving the floor freezing. Who knew the Romans had this all figured out? This ancient heating technique, inspired by the Romans, warmed hearts and homes for an impressive 1,000 years. Its influence even stretched to the Andalusian region, where it was used to heat luxurious baths. Today, you can still walk in the footsteps of history and explore the remains of hypercausts in many ancient cities across Anatolia and the Mediterranean. One of the most breathtaking examples is the Roman Bath of Ankara, a must-visit destination that showcases the ingenuity of Roman engineering. Fast forward to the present, and underfloor heating has evolved to become a modern marvel. It now works with either electric or boiler systems. But the fascinating part, the principle remains remarkably similar to the ancient Hippocaust. In modern underfloor heating, a boiler heats water that fills pipes laid under the floor in a specific pattern. This ensures that the heat is evenly distributed across the room. And the best part? The heat is fully controllable. But not every Roman home relied on underfloor heating. Some used furnaces. Don't forget to like and subscribe before we uncover whether these fiery systems were genius or a disaster waiting to happen. Surprisingly, large, built-in furnaces weren't common in Italian homes. Instead, most people relied on portable fire pans called faculi, filled with coal or charcoal. The heat was effective, but the smoke had to escape through doors or a hole in the roof, making it far from the safest or most efficient system. Yet, in the northern provinces, especially in Britain, furnace-heated houses were all the rage. Imagine walking through the streets of ancient Britain, surrounded by the warmth and glow of furnace-heated homes. It was a luxury that many Romans enjoyed, and it's fascinating to think about how they adapted to the colder climates of the northern provinces. But let's talk about the not-so-lucky inhabitants of insulae, apartment buildings. These apartment buildings were often cramped, poorly ventilated, and lacked the basic comforts of a warm and cozy home. Their heating arrangements were, quite frankly, a bit of a disaster. Without a central atrium, and with apartments piled on top of each other, it was impossible for residents to gather around a cozy fire like their peasant counterparts. So, inherently, insulais lacked fireplaces and furnaces altogether. Can you even imagine living in a cold, drafty apartment with no way to warm up on a chilly winter morning? Now, you might be thinking, but what about chimneys? Well, it turns out that only a few bakeries in Pompeii had a primitive version of a chimney, which was really just a pipe that vented smoke into a drying cupboard. Not exactly the same as the chimneys we know and love today. Archaeologists have searched high and low, but they haven't found any evidence of ventilation shafts or chimneys in the villas of Pompeii, Herculaneum, or even the houses of Ostia. But you see, these Romans always loved to keep warm and heat up, so they were forever finding new strategies to do so. The ancient Romans were also masters of relaxation and leisure, and one of their favorite ways to unwind was by visiting the Thermae. Basically, warm bathhouses. These incredible public bathhouses were an integral part of Roman life, offering a unique combination of relaxation, socialization, and even physical activity. The Thermae were the perfect escape from the hustle and bustle of daily life, where Romans could come to relax and recharge. But the Thermae were more than just a place to bathe. They were a social hub, a gym, and even a library. Romans would often spend hours soaking in warm water, letting the stresses of the day melt away. They would also engage in physical activity, such as yoga and weightlifting, to keep their bodies strong and healthy. 
The Thermae were also a place where Romans could socialize and conduct business. They would seal deals and forge connections over a warm cup of wine, surrounded by friends and acquaintances. And during the chilly Roman winters, the Thermae provided a welcome respite from the cold. Who wouldn't want to indulge in a warm, relaxing bath, surrounded by friends, food, and drink? And remember the Hippocaust. This system was a game changer for the Romans, allowing them to enjoy warm temperatures and relaxing baths throughout the year. It's a testament to their ingenuity and love of comfort that they were able to create such an incredible system, one that would be the envy of many modern spas and bathhouses. So you see, the ancient Romans were quite clever when it came to keeping their homes warm and cozy, but warmth wasn't just about heat. It was also about keeping the heat in. The Romans understood that insulation played a crucial role in maintaining comfortable temperatures. By using clever materials and techniques, they reduced heat loss in winter while keeping spaces cool in summer. To insulate their homes, the Romans used various materials, including wool from sheep or goats. Wool is a natural insulator, trapping warm air and preventing heat from escaping. Archaeologists have even found wool fibers in the walls of ancient Roman homes in Pompeii and Herculaneum. Another insulating material used by the Romans was human, or animal hair. They mixed hair with other materials like mud or clay to create a more effective insulating mixture. Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder even wrote about the use of hair as an insulating material in his book Naturalis Historia. The Romans also used plant fibers such as those from flax or hemp to create insulating materials. These fibers were often woven together to form a thick, warm layer. In addition to these materials, the Romans used mud and clay to fill gaps and cracks in their homes, reducing heat loss and preventing cold air from entering. Excavations at the Roman city of Ostia Antica have revealed extensive use of mud and clay in building construction. There were also different types of insulation. First, there was wall insulation. Roman builders didn't just stack bricks and call it a day. They filled the spaces between walls with insulating materials like wool or plant fibers, creating a barrier against the cold. This clever technique, known as opus cementitium, was used to build walls that were both sturdy and snug. Next up was floor insulation. Nobody likes cold floors, and neither did the Romans. They placed insulating layers beneath their floors, preventing chilly drafts from creeping into living spaces. Roman writer Palladius even wrote about this technique in his book, Opus Agriculturae. Who knew the Romans were such fans of warm feet? Last but not least, to keep warmth from escaping and to protect against leaks, the Romans sealed gaps and cracks in roofs using materials like mud and clay. Archaeologists have even found traces of this method in the ruins of the Roman Forum, showing just how widespread and effective their insulation techniques were. The ancient Romans, they were a clever bunch, weren't they? While we might assume they heated up their meals over an open flame, they actually had a more innovative approach. In the heart of Rome, the Romans used a game-changing technique to cook their bread and cakes. They confined fire in an oven. That's right, they had a primitive yet effective way of baking, and other foods were simmered to perfection over open stoves. Fast forward to February 2023, when construction workers in Genoa, Italy, stumbled upon an incredible discovery. An ancient stove dating back to around 300 AD. The Genoa government confirmed the find, and, amazingly, the furnace looks strikingly similar to a modern-day stovetop. Genoa, located on Italy's northwest coast, about 90 miles south of Milan, has given us a fascinating glimpse into the culinary habits of ancient Romans, who knew they were such pioneers in the kitchen. However, in the kitchens of ancient Pompeii and Rome generally, the air was thick with smoke and the floors were dirtier than a construction site. These cramped, poorly ventilated spaces were the domain of slaves, hidden away from public view. In even the most affluent homes, kitchens were often tiny, awkwardly shared with the latrine. Because, to the Romans, why not? Take the famous House of the Tragic Poet, for example. Its kitchen was laughably small, barely capable of whipping up a snack, let alone a grand banquet. But wait, it gets worse. Just beyond the garden wall of this very house, 
a cloth processing workshop, or fullery, was hard at work. And by hard at work, I mean they were knee-deep in human urine, the main ingredient in this messy, noisy, and downright stinky business. Archaeologists have even uncovered a stone cooking range and bronze cooking vessels in the kitchen of the House of the Veti, a Pompeian abode, giving us a glimpse into ancient cooking techniques. Dr. Joanne Berry, a researcher, even spilled the beans on how the Romans' cooking went down. Imagine bronze pots perched on iron braziers over a small fire, simmering away on top of the range. And for those without fancy tripods, the resourceful Pompeians used amphorae storage jars to prop up their cookware. But what about the fuel for these fires? Firewood was neatly stashed in an alcove beneath the range, keeping the cooking area tidy. So, what was on the menu? With cauldrons, skillets, and pans being the typical cooking vessels, it's clear that boiling was the cooking method of choice. Baking wasn't really a thing back then. Not all Pompeian homes were equipped with fancy masonry ranges or separate kitchens, though. Only the larger houses boasted these luxuries, while others relied on portable braziers to get their cook on. In the heart of an upper-class Roman domus was the kitchen, located conveniently near the peristylium, a fancy courtyard. The kitchen, or kalina, was the hub of culinary activity. The kitchen boasted an open fireplace for roasting and boiling, alongside a stove that's surprisingly similar to the charcoal stoves still used in Europe today. These stoves were often built into the wall, with a handy spot for fuel underneath. Portable stoves added an extra layer of convenience for some households. Archaeologists have also uncovered a treasure trove of kitchen utensils at Pompeii, showcasing the Romans' flair for design. Elegant spoons, pots, and beautifully crafted pastry molds reveal a people who valued both form and function. Trivets held pots and pans above the glowing charcoal, while other pots stood proudly on legs. In some homes, the shrine of the household gods had migrated from the atrium to the kitchen, watching over the culinary creations. And let's not forget about the heart of Roman entertainment, the dining room, or triclinium. This was the space where Romans would gather to share delicious meals and great company. You might be surprised to learn that the triclinium wasn't always located near the kitchen. With an abundance of slaves to do the legwork, convenience wasn't a top priority. Instead, Romans often had multiple triclinia, each used during different seasons to maximize sunlight and shade. The famous Roman architect Vitruvius suggested that the ideal triclinium should be twice as long as it is wide, but archaeological ruins show that this rule wasn't always followed. One thing's for sure, though. Romans loved dining al fresco. The peristylium, a courtyard surrounded by columns, often doubled as a dining space and some homes even had outdoor dining rooms, like the one found in the House of Sallust at Pompeii. Imagine enjoying a leisurely meal under the shade of an arbor, attended by a single loyal slave, just like the charming scene described by the Roman poet Horace. Dining in ancient Rome was all about savoring good food, wine, and company in a beautiful setting. The ancient Romans were true pioneers when it came to culinary delights and innovative heating solutions. They knew that a warm meal could be just what the doctor ordered to heat up their bodies, especially during those chilly Roman winters. That's why they loved indulging in poles, a hearty, warming dish made from vegetables, grains, and sometimes even meat. It was the perfect way to generate some internal heat and keep the cold at bay. And let's not forget, these Romans were true masters of innovation, always finding new and creative ways to heat up their food, homes, and lives. In fact, many of the modern conveniences we enjoy today owe a debt of gratitude to the ancient Romans. From central heating to culinary techniques, they were true trailblazers, figuring out solutions to everyday problems that would stand the test of time, that would stand the test of time.